Good morning, Grant County. This is Pastor Terry Leap coming to you live this morning from the Williamstown Baptist Church, welcoming you on behalf of our entire church family to our live Sunday morning broadcast of worship services here at the Williamstown Baptist Church. As I do each week, I want to remind you of how grateful we are to have you tuning in with us every Sunday morning, watching us and participating in worship with us. So many of you make comments to me when I see you in public about watching our broadcast, and I just want you to know our whole church family appreciates you so much. We do want you to know that we always welcome phone calls throughout the week, Monday through Friday during business hours. We'd like for you to give us a call and let us know how this television ministry has impacted your life. You can also share prayer requests with us. We would love to be able to pray for you and some of the issues that you're facing in life. Of course, we want you to keep up with us, if you're able to, by visiting the church website, williamstownbaptistchurch.com. There at the church website, you will be able to not only watch the Sunday morning service broadcasts, but you can also keep up with events in the life of the church, and you can even give securely to the support of this ministry right at the church website. Now, we hope you had a great Thanksgiving holiday. All of us are still uh, uh, getting over our meals with our family and, and settling in from the big Thanksgiving meal. But we are turning the corner to start thinking about Christmas in the Advent season. And of course, for us here at Williamstown Baptist Church, again this year, putting on our living Christmas tree is going to be a big ordeal and we want you to be a part of that with us. Please know that you can call the church office and ask about uh, tickets and uh, coming to see the Living Christmas Tree. Our performances this year will be on the 15th and 16th. And if you haven't seen our Living Christmas Tree before, you're going to be amazed at what the people of God in this church are doing through this wonderful project. It's a way for us to point to the real meaning of Christmas, to get people to focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ and to consider their own personal relationship with him this Christmas. And we do it in such a creative and, and musical and artistic way. If you've not seen it before, please, please, I pray, give us a call and find out if you're able to attend and see this live at our church. If not, we are going to see about broadcasting it again this year on this very channel. Be watching for dates and times for that broadcast. And as always, I'll ask you to pray for us and to pray for all the people who are working hard to make this project happen. Now this morning we're going to be turning the corner into the Advent season. We're going to be talking a lot about missions and looking at the sleeping church awakened in Acts chapter 8. My prayer is that God will meet you where you're at through his word and change you from the inside out. May he bless you as you worship with us this morning. 
Well, good morning, church. And welcome to our 11 o'clock worship service. We're so glad that you've chosen to be with us this morning and to worship with us. A very special welcome to each and every one of you here today. I hope that you were greeted on your way in this morning with this year's Advent book. We try to give one of these, initially one to each family, and these will replace our bulletins over the next few weeks until the uh, new year. And these booklets are great. They look beautiful this year. A very special thanks to uh, all the people, Marcy, Roxanne, Judy, Jim Howe, all the people that worked to, to get these printed and looking so good for us this year. But I pray that you'll take the time this morning to look through the first few pages, to read over the uh, blurb at the beginning about this year's theme, which is going to tie into our Living Christmas Tree presentation, but also about the third page in. You'll see the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering Week of Prayer, and over on the page to the right of that, our church-wide Christmas offering goal. These are both going to be important themes of our message this morning, and you're going to be hearing a lot about these things over the next few weeks. So please take the time to read that, begin praying together with us for these things, and being a part of them. Please remember that tonight we'll have a special service to sort of launch the Advent season. We call this the Hanging of the Green service. And this is a night when families are encouraged to come at 5.30 with your children. Anyone is welcome, of course. But there will be some ornament making and some uh, hot chocolate and music and desserts and such. This is a good time for families to begin talking about and participating in the Advent season. Following that at 6.30 will be our worship service here in the sanctuary. And Marcy has put together once again a wonderful uh, service, a hanging of the greens service for us this morning that I'm looking forward to participating in. Now, he didn't know I was going to do this and I didn't know he was going to be here, but I am just so delighted to see this good looking young Marine who has just finished his boot camp joining us again this morning. Chance Jordan, stand up, buddy. We are proud of you. We welcome you back. Oh, wait a second. Hold on. Hold on. He says, wait, his girlfriend's got to fix something. Got to be perfect. Come on now, hurry up. We're losing the momentum here. Uh, uh, this, this is, all right, there we go. Stand up, Chance. Welcome back home. God bless you, sir. We are proud of you, and we are glad to see you home with your family. Although I got to say, I'm, I don't approve of the hair. I'm, I'm used to the shag that hung down over your face for so long. Welcome home, Chance. We're glad to have you. Congratulations on everything. Now, church, if you will turn with me this morning for our call to worship to 1 Timothy chapter 1, the epistle of 1 Timothy chapter 1, and let's joyfully stand to our feet together as we prepare to hear the reading of God's perfect word, beginning in verse 12 of 1 Timothy chapter 1, where the apostle Paul writes, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus." The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. That Christ Jesus, listen to that again, came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Or the older translations say, I am chief. I think many of us can understand exactly where Paul was coming from there. Let's thank the Lord for his grace as we bow together in prayer this morning. Father, we are gathered here this morning in the name of your son Jesus to worship you in spirit and truth. We continue the celebration of thanksgiving. Every Lord's Day for us should be a thanksgiving day. A day of thanking you for your grace that has been poured out for us.
unworthy and unfit as we are, you have poured out grace and redeemed us and made us your own through Christ. We, like Paul, can identify with those words that we are the chiefest of sinners. We who have examined our hearts and seen the depth of our own sin and who have been made clean by the finished work of Jesus Christ at the cross, we, we can say amen and amen to that. We, we are the chiefest of sinners. Father, this morning, may we be grateful. May we worship you and serve you out of a heart of thanksgiving and gratitude. And I pray that whether it be encouraging one another or forgiving one another or giving our tithes or singing our songs or hearing your word, Father, I pray that all we do would bring glory to Christ without whom our redemption would not be possible. We do all this in his name, seeking his glory and the advancement of his kingdom throughout the earth. And together we say as a church, Amen. With joy, would you turn to someone and greet them, welcome them in the Lord as we prepare to sing together. Let's sing that and then I'll go up and check that song and we'll slide it in later. 
Proverbs we read, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. We have an opportunity now to worship the Lord through giving. So as these men prepare to receive our tithes and offerings, I'm going to ask Brother Tom if you would pray and ask God to bless gift and giver. give you a different perspective on being grateful and then we'll sing once again. Is this There's a short in that, and that's why we ordered a new sound system, which is going to be here when Dennis. It's not. Is you got the computer up? Because it worked in the first service. Well, I'm sorry that we're going to miss that, but I'll have to show you that again at some other time. Let's continue to worship. Let's not let that bother us. Uh, please stand as we sing one more song. My heart is filled with thankfulness. <laughs> 
children head out for the children's service. Who are they following this morning? Who's, who's leading the pack? All right, Miss Tanya is going to lead you guys out. Bye, kids. We love you. We'll miss you. But I'm sure we'll get you back later, right? I just want to say, as uh, we got to see that clip in the early service, it, it played and sounded okay. And I, I said when I got up to preach, that's probably the only time in my career I'll follow John Piper. And it was intimidating even then, you know, just following him on a video projection. So I, I went back to my office and got on my knees and I just prayed and prayed and prayed, Lord, let it not work in the second service. I can't follow John Piper again. Uh, I No, I didn't do that, of course. Uh, but it was a wonderful word on gratefulness. And uh, again, probably the only time I'll ever get to follow him. Uh, but someone that I admire and uh, treasure his teaching and the gift that he's been to the body of Christ. I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter 8 this morning. Acts chapter 8. And I want to talk about the church. The church sleeping. The church shaken. The church awakened. And the church sent. If you want to write down those words, they sort of outline the message this morning. The church sleeping, the church shaken, the church awakened, and the church sent from Acts chapter 8. While you're turning there, I want to ask you to be in prayer this morning as I preach. I want you to pray not only for those sitting around you in the pews who may need a word from the Lord today, but join me in praying for the nations. Be in a season, an attitude of prayer for the nations. I want you to pray this morning for the nation of India, where there's over 1.2 billion people. Let me say that again, 1.2 billion. That's four times the population of the United States, by the way. 1.2 billion people living on the Indian subcontinent, over 456 languages spoken in that nation, over 2,533 unique, distinctive people groups there. Only 5.84% of the nation is Christian of any stripe. And I pause even to use that term because that includes everything from Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses on through charismatic Pentecostal groups. Just any kind of Christian identity, 5.84%. Only 2.2% of, of the population of India is what we would recognize as evangelical Christian. The vast majority of Indians, over 902 million of them, are Hindu. I've been getting deeply acquainted with Hinduism for the last few weeks. Uh, no need to fear. I'm not converting. For my lectures in class, I have been reading and studying the history, the doctrines, the teaching of Hinduism. Over 902 million Hindus in India. This morning in Indonesia, a nation of 233 million people, there is a Christian population of only 16%, and only 5.6% of those, according to Operation World, is evangelical or would identify as evangelical Christians. The vast majority of Indonesians, over 187 million of them, readily identify as Muslim. And many of them have never even heard the gospel that we take for granted. In Japan this morning, there are an estimated 127 million plus people with a Christian population of less than 1.54% of any stripe. Less than one half of one percent identifies in Japan today as evangelical Christian. The vast majority of Japanese, over 90 million of them, identify as Buddhists. In the United States today, there are 318 million people, and 77.6% of us identify on paper as Christian. 28.9% would say we are evangelical Christian. But according to recent research, there are vast millions of Americans now, a growing number of millions, who identify as atheistic, agnostic, the nothings they're calling them. They don't identify with any religious category. Pray for them. <laughs> 
Right here in Grant County, there is an estimated population, the 2016 estimate sits just a little above 25,000 people in our county. And the vast majority, I would say probably upwards of 90%, would identify, if asked, as Christian. But this morning in our churches all across Grant County, and I think I know what I'm talking about here. I've gotten to know our churches and our ministers. I speak with many of them very regularly. I know what our churches are doing. All of our churches combined in Grant County today probably don't have 10% of our county population in them. Maybe 15%, 3,750 people are in church this morning in Grant County. The vast majority of our neighbors are unchurched or more than likely unsaved. Will you pray for those in India, for those in Indonesia, for those in Japan, for those around us in the United States, and those around us right here in Grant County that do not know Christ? If you begin praying for them, you're immediately overwhelmed with the sense of heaviness and burden for such lostness in the world today. What can we do? The task to go into the world and make disciples of all nations seems so overwhelming in light of the numbers and the statistics. For many of us, the ends of the earth seem like such an impossibility. We struggle to figure out how to reach our neighborhood. We struggle to reach our own community. And so for so many of us in church today, if there's any burden at all for the lost, we're burdened for those around us. But we don't have room in our hearts and in our minds to think about the Hindus of India or the Buddhists of Japan or the Muslims of Indonesia. We're thinking about our children, our neighbors, our co-workers. But the text of Scripture this morning in Acts chapter 8 reminds us of two things. And I want to encourage you with these two things this morning. They are undeniable truths grounded not only in Acts chapter 8, throughout the book of Acts, these truths are found, but especially in our text today. And the first truth is this, even when you don't see it, God is sovereignly at work throughout the world today making himself known and advancing his glory and his kingdom through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even when you don't see it, God is sovereignly at work in the world, even today, all around us, to the ends of the earth, making Christ known. The second truth, which follows on the heels of the first, is that God is doing this, as he always has, by using ordinary people like you, and like you, and like you, and like you. He's using ordinary people to make his name known among the nations. Next week, we are going to be invited into an opportunity. I alluded to this earlier, but we will be invited into an opportunity to join together with tens of thousands of other Southern Baptist churches in praying for missionaries and in praying for the nations. We'll be invited into an opportunity over the next four or five weeks to give generously and, and lavishly to support missionaries who are out there in Indonesia and in India and in Japan and the ends of the earth preaching the gospel. We have an opportunity to become participants in this work of making Christ known among the nations. We have an opportunity as ordinary Christians, to use Michael Horton's term, ordinary Christians, not radical ones, just ordinary ones. We have the opportunity to be used by God to participate in his plan to reach the nations. Will we? Will we? We read about the church in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. And we start off with some strange words at the beginning of the verse. We read in verse 1, and Saul approved of his execution. Isn't that a strange way to start a chapter? Sounds like we're kind of jumping into the middle of something, doesn't it? Of course, you know the, the biblical text did not include chapter and verse divisions when it was written down by its original authors. Those were added much later, and sometimes they chose to divide in rather odd places that chop up stories, and this is one such case. 
The statement that Saul approved of his execution in verse 1 is alluding back to the events of chapter 7, which have their basis in the events of chapter 6. You remember how in chapter 6, a church which was divided internally uh, by, the, by the nitpicking and, and, and division of, of the widows in the church who were fighting amongst one another, uh, the church divided uh, called out from amongst itself a number of servants, uh, men who could serve the daily needs of the church, men who could, who could meet the needs of those widows and bring peace and unity to the congregation. And one of them was Philip. This one, Philip, begins preaching a sermon in chapter 7 to the people of Israel and pointing them towards Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection as the pivotal event in redemptive history. And I love the way that Stephen brings his message to an invitation in verse 51. I love his, his invitation in verse 51 of chapter 7. You stiff-necked people! Uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit just like your fathers did. Wouldn't that be a great way to wrap up a sermon? There would be some special meetings called, I'm sure, if you got to the invitation and I, I pointed my finger and said, You bunch of stiff-necked, hard-hearted, uncircumcised people. You're stubborn and you don't listen to the Spirit just like your parents and your grandparents. That's how Stephen ends his sermon. And as you might imagine, the response in verse 52 and 53 and 54 is not good. Uh, people begin gnashing their teeth. They're enraged. They pick up stones in the verses that follow, and they begin putting Stephen to death. They begin stoning him. That is, killing him with stones, young people. Stoning him, putting him to death. And notice in verse 58, the witnesses, those who were present, they laid down their garments. In other words, they took off their outer garments so they could wind up really well and throw the stones really hard. And when they did, they laid them at the feet of one Saul of Tarsus. This is the one in chapter 8 and verse 1 that we read of who approved of the execution of Deacon Stephen as he preached the gospel. So with that context, we go on to read in the rest of verse 1 that there arose on that day, beginning with the stoning of Stephen, a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. Let's pause there for a minute. Great persecution. What is that? What is persecution? We don't really know here in the Western church. We have to look to our brothers and sisters in Christ overseas. In places like Indonesia, in places like India, in places like Pakistan and Afghanistan. We have to look to our brothers and sisters in Christ overseas to see that for many in the world today, to name the name of Christ carries a heavy, heavy cost. Christians are still shot and killed in the presence of their children. Wives are still humiliated in the presence of husbands and family for not denouncing Christ. Children are still sold into slavery. Men and women lose their jobs. They lose their homes. They're reduced to lifestyles of begging and living on the streets in many places around the world simply for naming the name of Christ. And we read in verse 1 that this kind of treatment, perhaps not as bad as what you see today, but I suppose that would be relative based on uh, whether or not you were in the persecution. Persecution arose. People were dying. Deacons are being stoned. You can go back and read in chapters 3 and 4, and you'll see that some measure of persecution already existed. Peter and John are thrown in jail. They're whipped, they're scourged, they're told to stop preaching this Jesus, but they keep on doing it. And by the time we get to chapter 8 and verse 1, we read that God unleashes this wave of persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And notice this, the church is scattered all throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. That's a strange thing, isn't it? That Luke would include that phrase, except for the apostles? 
See, what he's telling us here in verse 1 is that God uses this persecution to forcibly move the church out of Jerusalem. And did you pick up on the fact that in verse 1 it says, once they left Jerusalem, look at the places they started going. Judea and Samaria. Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Sound familiar? Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, the Lord Jesus had told the infant church that when the Spirit came upon them, they would receive power and they were to be His witnesses where? In Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the utmost parts of the earth. But apparently the church had fallen asleep. Scholars, commentary authors disagree about the exact length or timeline. How many years passed between Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 8? We don't know for sure. But most scholars fall somewhere between 5 and 8 years. Think about that for a moment. The events of chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, those happen over a span of, of a few years, at least five perhaps. The church had been told five years earlier to get out of Jerusalem and begin expanding into the surrounding areas. But by the time we reach chapter 8 and verse 1, they had not done it. And it takes the Lord unleashing persecution against His own bride to get His people out of Jerusalem. To wake them up! from their slumber, and get them out into the world. Now, what could distract a church for that many years? That they would be off task. That they would forget about their purpose. That they would forget why God had placed them there. What sort of things distracts a church for years and derails them from the purpose for which God birthed them? Well, you can see in chapters 3 and 4 that there was a lot of good local work going on in Jerusalem. In fact, there's multiple verses that indicate thousands were being saved right there in Jerusalem. Miracles were being performed. People were being converted. The Holy Spirit was moving. I mean, there was some good stuff going on right here in our backyard. But then you get to chapter 5 and you find out that the church was, was having to deal with some sin issues, right? And through the death of Ananias and Sapphira who lied to God, who tried to deceive the church through their, their own uh, 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 wicked hearts, uh, God, has to, God has to punish and discipline the church to remind them that they're to be a holy people. And then you get to chapter 6. And what immediately follows the lack of holiness in chapter 5? Division and bickering and infighting in chapter 6. Right? The Hellenistic widows are mad at the Jewish widows and they've formed into little camps and they're bickering and fighting with one another, uh, probably, probably treating one another at church on Sundays. You know, they just wouldn't talk to each other. Uh, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just be real passive aggressive. with. I won't talk to you. I'll walk past you and not speak a word to you. And that's how these widows are treating each other. They're dividing the fellowship, you see. So much that the church has to act on this. They have to respond by calling out some deacons whose purpose was not only to serve, but to bring back unity and peace in the church. That was their role. By the time we get to chapter 8, we find a church that was asleep, a church that was distracted. Surely we don't have churches in our Southern Baptist Convention today that are asleep and distracted in the face of the great commission and the great need in the world around us. Is it possible for a church today to be only inwardly focused on its own needs, to only care about its own community, to see good things happening here but to forget about the rest of the world? Sure it is. Is it possible that churches today are mired in mediocrity because of indwelling sin in the congregation? Sure. Is it possible that churches today, just like ours, churches all around us here in North America and in the West, with great freedom and prosperity, are mired in mediocrity and have forgotten the task because they're so inwardly divided? People not talking to each other, people that can't stand each other, people that don't want to be in church with one. Could that happen in churches today? I read a dissertation this past Friday night. 
Yes, you heard that right. That is how big of a nerd I am. On Friday nights, this is what my life has been reduced to. I'm sitting at home reading a dissertation, Mark, from, from a brother in Christ who just graduated from Southwestern. And he wrote about the great discord and disharmony that's caused in churches when pastors are forced out. That's, I read this with great interest because I've been through this in my life. And one of the significant proofs that he arrived at after looking at dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens, hundreds of situations where pastors were forced out, is that over time, those churches where this kind of internal division takes place, they stall out for months, even years, because they're so distracted from the task at hand. They're so distracted. They, they don't do the Great Commission. They don't reach people. And those churches begin plateauing, and they begin dying because they can't get past their internal dissension. What puts churches to sleep for years to the point that it takes the Lord raising up a great chaotic situation like persecution to wake people up from their slumber and to push them out into the world. Whatever the case, the church at Jerusalem was not moving, so the Lord steps in and says, I'm going to move you out into the world. I'm going to move you into Judea and Samaria where you should have been all along. I'm going to put you out there. And he uses persecution to do it. Lord, help us. We might pray for two things here. Number one, that it never comes to that in our church or in the church in the West. May God wake us up before he has to use persecution to get our attention. Number two, that we'll have the discernment and wisdom to know when the Lord is trying to wake up the church today and say, you need an alignment. You need to get back to the business of making disciples. Look as we read on in verse 2. Following the stoning of Stephen, we read that certain devout men buried him, made great lamentation over him. No doubt it took courage for them to do this, but in verse 3, Saul, he continues ravaging the church, tearing it apart. He's entering house after house, Look at the descriptive language here. He's dragging off men and women and committing them to prison. Can you get the sense of why Paul would say later, I'm the chief of sinners. I don't deserve this rich salvation that has been given to me freely in Christ. I don't deserve forgiveness. I'm the chief of sinners. Can you see why Paul would say that now, looking back in hindsight? He didn't just reject Jesus. He wasn't just apathetic about the whole thing. He was actually working against the cause of Christ. He was persecuting. He was separating families. He was dragging off people who were innocent of any crimes and putting them in prison because of their faith in Christ. But God in His sovereignty is always at work. And so we come to verse 4. And in verse 4 we read that those who were scattered went about preaching the word. I'm going to stop there. There's a lot more in this text. I'm going to stop there, though, for a few minutes. I want to talk about what verse 4 indicates, what it shows us. It raises a number of questions when you look at that closely. First of all, who are we talking about here in verse 4 when it says those who were scattered? Well, grammatically, let's go back and look at verse 1. They were all scattered. So there's this idea again of the scattered ones. Who is the they in verse 1? It's the church in Jerusalem. The church in Jerusalem, except for the apostles. Do you know what that means? That means this was a movement of lay people. Right? Luke makes that a point to tell us. It was not the apostolic leaders at the top that were leading this thing. When God scattered the church, it was ordinary people. It was those tens of thousands of men and women and boys and girls and families and even those grumbling widows in chapter 6 who were a part of that church that got scattered out abroad. And because of this persecution, ordinary people went 
out preaching the gospel. They went out preaching the word. And it becomes to us a powerful reminder of what it looks like when in the church everyone is a proclaimer. The most effective evangelistic methodology that any church can have is to mobilize the ordinary Christian in the pew to become a gospel-sharing Christian. See, nowhere in the scripture is this divide that we've created in the church today where paid staff and ministry get to do all the ministry work, where we count on them to win people to Christ. Uh, we look to pastors and staff members and ministry team leaders. We look to them to go out and reach the lost. But the rest of us, we're just here to kind of pay the light bills and pay their salary. Uh, that's a fairly recent development in the church over the last few hundred years, but it's nowhere found in Scripture. The church in the New Testament is an organic body made up of individuals, all of whom are born-again believers in possession of the powerful Holy Spirit with a deep-seated concern for the lost. So much so that Paul will explain this later in Ephesians chapter 4 when he writes to the church saying in essence, my job as a pastor teacher, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, is to equip the saints to do the ministry. That, that, that's, what, that's what the role of the pastor teacher is, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4. We've forgotten largely in the church today that it's God's will and desire for each and every one of us to be among those who go into the world preaching the gospel. Let's be clear this morning, it is the God-given duty of every Christian to be involved in sharing the gospel and making disciples. If you're not involved, you should be. And if you have no desire, that may be a sign that you are not a Christian at all. Charles Haddon Spurgeon famously said there are only two kinds of of Christians. Every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. A missionary or an imposter. We have before us the command. We know what the Lord's will is for us to participate in reaching the nations and advancing the cause of Christ. Why is it that so few step forward? Charles Swindoll wrote down in one of his books many years ago a story, he calls it, about four people. Four people named everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. And he says this is characteristic of most churches. Listen, there was an important job to do and everybody was asked to do it. Everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it. But nobody did it. Somebody then got angry because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody would do it. But nobody realized everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. I read that again. Everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. I like that little story. We have in our churches today plateaued evangelistically. We're not reaching near as many people as we did in previous decades, previous generations, and there could be a lot of other factors involved in that. The world is changing, I get that. People are more and more difficult to reach, I get that. But could at least part of the problem be that we have forgotten that we are a sent people? Will it take the Lord using some catastrophic event again in his church today to scatter us and force us out into the surrounding communities, preaching the gospel and investing ourselves in the work of reaching the nations? The second question to be answered in verse 4 is presented very simply. What did they... What did they preach? Well, it simply says they preached the word. Now, maybe they went out talking about Genesis chapter 1. Maybe they were talking about the flood. Maybe they were talking about the covenants. Maybe they were talking about uh, the Psalms and the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. I don't know. It doesn't really specify. And certainly all of those things are important and they have their place in the diet of a Christian disciple. 
But more than likely, the way Luke is using the term here in verse 4 is the way that he uses it throughout the book. That is, preaching the word becomes a metaphor, if you will, for proclaiming the good news of Christ. They were going out and telling people that you couldn't be saved unless you trusted in the finished work of Christ. You couldn't be born again unless you placed your faith in the Messiah, the Lamb of God the chosen one of Israel who was crucified for our sins, who was buried and who rose again for our justification. And you know, everywhere in the book of Acts, we read about the people proclaiming. That's what they were were teaching. That's what they were sharing. The other things are important. They have their place in the steady diet of a disciple. But there is no discipleship without conversion. And there is no conversion without the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We might rightly say discipleship starts with a right understanding of what it means to be born again. And everything else is built on that foundation. Make sure, church, that as we go into the world, what we're sharing is the gospel of Christ. The good news that points lost and broken and hurting people to the only hope they have for forgiveness and eternal life. Now, We're not told exactly why, in verse 4, these people were finally faithful to go. We would think it has something to do with the disciplinary actions of verse 1, the persecution that came against them. But let me speculate for just a moment on why I think they went out preaching the gospel to others. The very first and most simple reason is because they had believed it themselves. They had believed it themselves. And they found the gospel to be news that was worth sharing. News that deserved to be shared with others. We live in a world where everybody broadcasts everything on Facebook anymore, right? Someone has a baby. We put 100 pictures up and announce it. And it quickly gets 500 or 1,000 likes. Someone gets married, and we're not ashamed to tell the world... Baby has his first bowel movement. We got to put that up and tell everybody about it. And everybody gives it likes and thumbs up. I mean, we just, we're we're not afraid to tell anything. Why are we so reluctant, though, to share the good news of Christ if we believe it? The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 3 says to the Corinthians, I preach to you that which I first received. He had received it and believed it and been transformed by it, and so he had no hesitation in sharing it with others. Those in the church at Jerusalem preached the gospel because they had believed it. Because they had believed that without Christ, men would die and spend an eternity separated from God. They believed in the judgment of God. Francis Chan said in one of his books that if Christians really and truly believed what we say we believe about hell, every single one of us would be out this afternoon begging and pleading with our loved ones to turn to Christ. These Christians in Jerusalem believed there were consequences to sin, consequences that were real, Eternal separation from God. A message that needed to be shared. A message that had, that had changed them. It had transformed them first. And when you are born again and receive the gospel into your life and you're, you're changed from the inside out, you know it's power. You know it's power to deliver you from bondage and sin. Not just eternally and often in the future, but in the in the here and now, in the everyday life of a believer. They shared it because their master, the Lord Jesus, had commanded them to do it and they wanted to be obedient. So here's a group of ordinary Christians preaching the word because they believed it, because they believed men without Christ would would spend an eternity in hell, because they had been transformed themselves by the word, and because they wanted to be obedient to the master. What would Christianity look like in the 21st century? If the church, having believed the gospel and been transformed by it, believing what the Bible teaches about the condemnation of hell, 
and taking seriously the lordship of Jesus Christ and his commands to make disciples, what would Christianity look like in the 21st century if we, like they, simply went and proclaimed it? See, the last question, which I'll move through very quickly, takes you through about the next two or three chapters of Scripture. What happened when these ordinary people, scattered by persecution, went into the world preaching the gospel? Well, you look in verses 5 through 8, and you see that there was a revival of sorts in Samaria. Verse 12 tells us that many of the people believed and were baptized. Verses 9 through 25 tell us the story of a miraculous salvation. This, this magician, Simon the sorcerer, even he's converted and humbled and taught about the Holy Spirit, that it can't be bought with a price. We go on to read in chapter 8 and verses 26 through 39 about Philip encountering a eunuch, preaching the gospel to him and seeing this eunuch converted and baptized. And then you look over in chapter 8 and verse 40 and you see that Philip himself went on a preaching tour up the western coast of Samaria and Judea in Azotus or Ashdod. Along the Judean and Samarian coast, Philip goes preaching the gospel. In chapter 9, verses 1 through 30, there's the account of the miraculous conversion of Saul. Yeah, the same one in chapter 8 and verse 1. Who had approved of the execution of Christians. He's now miraculously saved and converted. And in chapter 9 and verse 31, the church is again multiplying and being built up. Notice, throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria, there's peace. Despite persecution, there's peace and building up of the church. In chapter 9, verses 32 through 42, 43, Peter himself embarks on a preaching tour throughout Lydda and Joppa and Caesarea. He learns in chapter 10 an important lesson about the Gentiles. Through a God-sent vision, he learns over in verse 28, God has shown me that I shall not call any person common or unclean. And then in verses 34 through 48, Peter preaches the gospel to the Gentiles. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and now Saul, who will become the apostle to the Gentiles, and Peter, the church leader from Jerusalem, begins to see that God is going to branch out this enterprise, this new covenant community, to the uttermost parts of the earth. The church comes a long way in just three chapters from its slumber in chapter 8 and verse 1, its inward focus in chapter 8 in verse 1, to its international vision by the end of chapter 10, the church comes a long, long way. But have we? Are we convinced still that God wants to use us to make His glory known to the nations? Do we see ourselves as having an important part in that endeavor? If we'll go to the next slide, I, I close with these four applications. If you write anything down, I hope you'll write these down. I think they're grounded in the text. The first one is that every born-again believer in Christ is called to be an active part of His plan to make disciples of all nations. That means none of us are excused from being witnesses. I don't have the gift of evangelism, Brother Terry. You know there is no gift of evangelism in the New Testament. There's only the gift of the evangelist to the body of Christ in Ephesians chapter 4, but there's no gift of evangelism. Every one of us are instead commanded to be evangelists. So we can't really weasel out of that one. We are commanded to share the gospel. So when I say every born-again believer in Christ, that means each and every one of us, empowered by the Spirit, are called to be witnesses to the gospel. Number two, if we don't recognize this and act accordingly, God may have to use catastrophic measures to wake us up from our slumber and our disobedience. God help us. Number three, our task is really simple. To tell the gospel to everyone. That's your task. Notice that your task is not to win everyone. You can't do that. 
It's not your place to convert them. It's not your place to change their heart. In fact, you can't do that. That's a God thing. Your task is simple. Tell the story of Jesus and His love. How it changed your life, gave you hope, introduced you to forgiveness and reconciliation and how it can do the same for them. Will everybody want to hear it? Nope. But will some? Yes. They will. And imagine if 175 or 200 or 300 Christians left church this morning in Williamstown and went out and started telling every person they know lovingly and passionately that Jesus saves. What a difference it would make. The fourth truth is that if we are willing to make ourselves available, God will use us. He will use us to make His glory known among the nations. You have a part to play, and I do too. We will have opportunities to participate in this beginning next week. I pray that we will be faithful. Do you know why your mom used to tell you to not pull loose threads on sweaters, shirts, articles of clothing. How many of you used to do that when you'd find a loose string? You'd grab it and wrap your finger around it. You'd start pulling it, wouldn't you? Mom used to smack me on the head and say, stop doing that. Don't pull those loose threads. She knew that even one thread seemingly insignificant to you while you're chewing it, that one little thread was important to the integrity of the whole garment. And that if you started unraveling and pulling out just one thread, pretty soon other threads would come loose. And before long, a whole seam would come undone. Or you'd have a large hole in your sweater or your shirt. And once you start pulling those threads loose, you find out that every few inches of Thread and string matters, that they're all woven in together intricately. And as long as each piece of thread woven together so intricately holds its place, the garment is beautiful and whole and strong. But you begin loosening and pulling out little threads one at a time and the whole garment becomes unraveled. In the tapestry of God's kingdom, listen, every thread matters. Strong and whole and in its place, all of us link together and are used by God to create something beautiful and redemptive and glorifying to Him. We all have a part and a role to play in this endeavor. So this morning as we conclude, I ask you, are you, are you born again, first of all? Because if you're not if you don't know Christ, discipleship for you can't begin until you yield to Him as Lord. Turn from your sins, receive His finished work, call upon Him as Savior. That's where it has to start for you. Are you a part of this church? Now this isn't the only church, not the biggest, maybe not even the best in the world, I don't know. But it's Christ's bride. And here is where you plug your life into a community and you grow and you're accountable to one another and you, and you serve and you minister and you sing and you give. And despite all of its flaws, God uses His church to grow us, to strengthen us, to weave us together. Are you a part of His church? Are you living in sin or division with some other Christian hindering the work of the Spirit in local churches? Are you willing to say today, Lord Jesus, I want you to shake me up, wake me up, and send me into the world. I don't want to stay where I'm at. He'll honor that prayer if you ask him today with a sincere heart as we pray together. Father, speak to us now and draw us to your Son. Make us the body of Christ propelled into the world. Ordinary people sharing the good news. Knowing that we are playing a part in something far greater than ourselves and far more magnificent than ourselves. We are
We are being woven into the tapestry of your growing and advancing kingdom, your redemptive kingdom. So I pray this morning that those who are lost would turn to Christ, would confess him publicly today as Lord. I pray that those who may not be connected with churches or who may be far from you in fellowship would return to you and that we would experience our own kind of awakening here even this morning. We'll give you all the thanks knowing that anything accomplished is from you. And we'll ask it in the name of your son Jesus. Amen. As we stand together this morning for our time of invitation, our time of decision, when if the Lord has spoken to you about a move, about a decision, about a need for something in your life, step out and come for counsel today. Jesus.